Hey everyone, Brian Zane here. Well, WWE has been riding high off the fumes of WrestleMania 40 for several weeks now, but how long will the high last before the cold, empty feeling returns? We might get a glimpse into that answer in this, my review of Backlash 2024 from Lyon, France. It is the first PLE, PPV, call it what you will, to come from France. And uh, this was a show that absolutely did not disappoint. Boy, after this and Puerto Rico last year, I think, making Backlash kind of like the home of the international pay-per-view after WrestleMania. It seems to be working really well. If you thought the fans in San Juan were on another level compared to any other WWE crowd, then man, I think the fans in France took that to a level beyond that. That was just, honestly, they're the MVP of this show above any of the matches you see or any of the wrestlers who all do well, by the way. There's really not a terrible match on this card uh, by any means, but man, the, the big takeaway from this show, the thing that you're going to remember beyond the actual like wins and losses and everything, is the audience here. They were just absolutely insane. I mean, un, de, simplement de, simplement de. You heard that a lot. <laughs> That's the one thing. There is a lot of repetition in the chants, especially in the main event. Um, they just get spammed with a lot of repeats, and we'll get to that. But it was still a really fun crowd, and uh, just made everything more heightened. If this show goes more than a minute more than three hours long, it's because the wrestlers are just soaking in these entrances with these pops unlike anything you've heard. There's a lot to talk about in this show. Let's begin with the opening tag team match as Randy Orton and Kevin Owens take on the Bloodline 2.0 in Solo Sokoa and Tamatonga making his official in-ring debut for WWE. Uh, this has been, you know, a lot's changed the Bloodline since my WrestleMania review. Uh, Roman Reigns, of course, has been on sabbatical since uh, he lost the title. Uh, Jimmy Uso was kicked out and Tamatonga's brought in here. Solo is rebuilding the Bloodline in his own image and Paul Heyman, the wise man, can only sit back in horror as this whole thing is just manifesting around him and he's seems kind of powerless to do anything about it. So as Bloodline lore goes past this tribal chief phase, you know, I'm very curious and I'm intrigued to see where this is going. And we do get another development in this match as well. There's this big We Want Roman chant before the first bell even rings. And before the match officially begins, we get this big brawl with all four guys in there. The agents and the referees are coming in to break it up. Suddenly, GM Nick Aldis comes in and makes it a street fight and the crowd just goes rabid for that one and it's on. We immediately go to split screen mode and we see the two different uh, fights happening. At one point there's a good length of time where we're getting a split screen just two different angles of the same fight. Uh, Kevin Owens hits this DDT on the steps to Solo. Out come the trash cans. Uh, Orton just clatters Tamatonga with one. Uh, welcome to WWE. Kendo sticks and tables all met with more massive pops. They do mention Tamatonga's history in New Japan and the opponents he had and everything. It does almost sound Sound like he, you know Michael Cole's reading off a Wikipedia entry, but the fact that he is still mentioning it is just—it's a post Vince WWE. You know, every single show you watch, you get a little more reminders of just how it's not Vince's company anymore, and we acknowledge the past and we acknowledge the different companies and like. You know, that I think is one of the coolest things. It's a very subtle thing, but it's super cool about this new phase we're in in WWE where we do acknowledge outsiders and don't pretend that WWE is the only thing there. Like I said, Tamatonga is definitely getting his initiation into this matchup. He gets welts on his back. He takes a, well, a twisting fisherman buster off the top rope from KO through like four different chairs. It's absolutely brutal. The cover, the win perhaps? No, the referee is quote, pulled out by Tonga Loa, the other half of Gorillas of Destiny, Tamatonga's brother. I say quote, pulled out because it's not actually what happened. Uh, he missed his cue, didn't pull the referee out in time, so the referee had to stop himself and go, whoa, which is pretty hilarious, but I think the camera angle covered up for it well enough. But yeah, still a big moment that he shows up there, surprising the way he did. That allows Solo to take over. He puts the Uranagi on a KO through the chair, hits the spike, there's the cover and the win, so the rogue bloodline stands tall while Owens looks to be sick on the mat. I give this match four stars out of five. It's a hell of an opener, and it's just a great uh, brawl-style matchup here. I think KO and Randy Orton have a great 
character chemistry. I love the fact because these two guys are such have been such despicable heels, but can also be very charming faces uh, on their own. So I think having the two of them together, I think, makes for some very compelling television. And uh, I think that they're also great brawlers too. And I think that it just works well for this matchup. Again, uh, Tama Tonga really went through the rigor in this one as his kind of introduction into the company. Uh, they love to debut new Bloodline members at international shows. Look at how they debuted Solo Sokoa, for instance. Um, you know, it wasn't Jacob Fatu. A lot of people were thinking that Jacob Fatu is going to be there. We haven't gotten him yet. Not saying he won't be there, but uh, they're building, obviously, to something here. It really feels like they're building a new Bloodline Civil War where, you know, maybe we'll get Roman and the Usos reuniting and we'll get this old versus new Bloodline. Where's The Rock fit into all this? Building up to War Games, maybe? I think there's some really cool intrigue with this. I think every time we get sick of the Bloodline, they do manage to pivot just enough where it's like, okay, we're gonna keep this thing going. And I think that, that that is the next logical step. I think the fans, based on the reaction in this matchup, they already want to see Roman back. And um, I think that setting up something for him to return at SummerSlam, maybe, leading to this Bloodline Civil War Part 2, would be pretty cool. Women's title, triple threat up next, as Bailey defense against Naomi and Tiffany Stratton. And you know, France loves them some Tiffy time, evidently. You know, cause you know, almost everyone got like pops, but then there are like, pops. And I think Tiffany Stratton definitely got one of those. The fans really love her here. Uh, there's some, some great three person spots in this matchup here. Uh, one of my favorites is the sunset flip leading into the drop kick for good measure. There's some nice work with Tiffany and Bailey in this matchup one-on-one. -on -one. Bailey catching Tiff doing the handsprings, but it turns into a roll up. Fighting on the outside, Naomi hitting a blockbuster off of the barricade. Bailey going on this big run here by the end. Hits sort of a Bailey to belly and we get a kick out. We get this recreation of the Tiffany Naomi kind of cartwheel spot at Elimination Chamber earlier this year. Uh, Tiffany hitting the Alabama slams to both women on the announce tables, which looks particularly just rough is the way they land. There are a lot of awkward lower back landings on this show. Did you notice this? Like almost every match, like somebody lands, they rotate a little too much, they don't get quite flat enough, and they take all these hard hits just like bam, right in the lower back, like hip area. And man, some of those look pretty brutal. We get a spontaneous double team by Naomi and Bailey. So it's just the two of them for a minute. Naomi with a roll up, countered by Bailey for the win, and we get sportswomanship. I give it three and a half stars out of five. Another solid matchup. It took a minute for it to really get going. I think once it crossed the halfway point, though, I think it really started picking up and becoming a lot better. Uh, yeah, very fun match. I don't think it's an issue of if, but when Tiffany Stratton is going to get a championship. I mean, just the reaction that she has gotten in her short time on the main roster has been pretty phenomenal. And she's such a natural at this. Like, she reminds me a lot of Bianca Belair in that sense of somebody who is, like, you know, taken from outside of wrestling and put in and she has this character and it's just like it just it, it's so quick to learn and quick to get it I think that the sky's the limit for her especially at her age I think that by this time next year she will have either won the women's money in the bank or the women's rumble so that was, that's my bold prediction she's going to win one of those two things by this time next year do you agree with me post it in the comments we get this moment backstage where Jay Uso is getting ready for his match he's met by the bloodline 2.0 and we get this look on Paul Heyman's face telling the story. He's trapped. He needs help. Save me, Brother Jay. We go to that match now. Jay Uso challenging the Judgment Day's Damian Priest for the World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, and boy, speaking of iconic entrances and the crowd really understanding the assignment, as they say, what a moment, what an entrance for Jay. Coming in, he's out in the crowd. Everyone's got their phones and they're going up and down together. Uh, that was just such a cool moment. And the, the noise, man, you can't, you cannot discount how consistently loud this crowd was for just about everything. We'll say the yeet on me oos sign. Hmm, that was certainly a choice. Jay doing the yeet taunt, and I love how Damien has like no time for that, because at one point he gets his heat back. He does it once as well, once he's getting his heat. Some really good work back and forth between the two of them in this matchup. The crowd is just alive for all of it here. I think that uh, Jay, you know, 
Jay needed this matchup. He needed it a lot after his disappointing WrestleMania matchup with Jimmy. Uh, this was not that. It was much better. It was not all super kick spams. As the match goes on, JD McDonough comes in to cheap shot Uso. Priest gets in his face about it, makes fun of, quote, his big ass head. Jay kicks JD in said head and splashes Priest. We get a kick out, though. Priest goes for South of Heaven. It's countered into a spear. Finn Balor even comes in with a distraction. One of my favorite parts of this matchup is the brain back heel doinks sign that makes its way on hard cam. Priest hits his spinning kick. He goes for another one, but Jay with his kicks hits the splash again, but JD putting Damien's foot on the rope. And at the end, it's Priest who yeets the yeeter with the South of Heaven off the uh, second or top rope onto Jay. And that's how he wins and retains. But after the bell, you've got the Judgment Day guys coming in, stomping away at Jay, and Damien pushes him off and says, none of that, sirs. And that gets a big pop. And boy, Boy, they are just telegraphing in a big way. Face turn for Damian Priest coming real soon. Uh, I give this one four stars out of five. Again, much big, imp much needed improvement for Jey Uso. He really needed that matchup. And even in defeat, still looked pretty strong. It took two other guys to beat him. And yeah, they're really signaling that Damian Priest is headed for a face turn after this. You know, I think Raw definitely needs it. With Seth out, uh, I think that him stepping up as kind of a new baby face uh, would be good. I think Damian's done that role in the Judgment Day for long enough and people want to see him branch out on his own again and I think that'd be really cool to see um, you know maybe the Judgment Day lives on with you know Finn and JD uh, and then you've got this breakaway when Rhea Ripley comes back and Damian Priest turns face and I don't know what you can really do with that perhaps but um, I think there is there's definitely there's there's money on the table with Damian Priest turning face here this is the largest gate of any arena show. We get another QR code for what is definitely Bo Dallas, and it's time for our women's tag team championship match as Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair challenging the Kabuki Warriors. And uh, one of the biggest casualties in this match early on, Asuka's face paint, because the very first move she does with Bianca, she gets half of her paint imprinted on, uh, on Bianca's shoulder and chest. Jade is just far too powerful for Kyrie Sane, hitting some power moves. They do a double team where Kyrie takes a rough looking fall on the lower back like I mentioned. Just this big dive to the outside on Bianca though. Jade is tagged in and she's a house of fire until she gets some back fists from the champion. Then this like rough looking backbreaker I think is what it was. Uh, Cargill just looks to be out of it. I don't know if she got her bell rung or whatever but a switch definitely got hit at that point and it was just like kind of rough going where everyone had to work around Jade and that definitely the, the awkwardness felt palpable there. But they do recover and Jade recovers. I mean, the finish is just incredible. The way she catches uh, Kyrie in a Hurricane Rana attempt and all the different changing of positions to get her into the Jaded just from a standing position, just tossing her around. That is just phenomenal strength. Then Bianca hits the KOD on Asuka onto Kyrie, and then we get the cover and the win. New women's tag team champions. I give this two and a half stars out of five. It is the lowest rated match on this show, but still it's a fine match. Even when you look past the rough parts with Jade, I, once again, I think that the women, uh, the other women involved did have to kind of work around her at times. Uh, you know, her wrestling ability, uh, Jade's that is, has always been secondary in AEW and now. I think the wrestling ability and what she actually does is truly secondary to the aesthetic, the it factor that she possesses. That was always the case in AEW and, you know, continues to be that way here. Um, you know, uh, the whole narrative was, oh, she's going to get so much better with performance center training. And like, well, right now she's the same, essentially, as she was in AEW. So, could be a slow burn, though. We'll see how she does in the months to come. I think this is a big win for her, really, you know, that, that puts the rocket to her and just kind of solidifies her star power aligning with Bianca Belair, especially that's definitely a great, you know, great entry point, so to speak. Main event time for the undisputed WWE Championship as Cody Rhodes defends against Aju Styles. And speaking of styles, allow me to repeat a joke that I did on social media this weekend. The Francais community. I love this factoid here that AJ is the first man to fight Dusty Rhodes and Cody Rhodes.
Rhodes in world title matches. That is a uh, incredible statistic. And also something incredible is just how the fans in Lyon are still just like amped and like that one lull of silence in the women's tag team match was all the rest they needed because they are just back on it here and full throat, full throttle here for this main event matchup. If it's not un, deux, simplement deux, it's il est vraiment phénoménal, da, 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 that it, literally everything AJ did, they got the il, il est vraiment <laughs> chant. Also, I popped for Cody doing the thing. He did the Stardust taunt. I thought that was cool. We also get the first ever Stardust chant. This is a great matchup here. I mean, it's between two guys who are really just well versed and they have such great chemistry together. I think they're two of the best emotional uh, wrestlers right now in WWE. Uh, the crowd is also a big factor, it makes everything elevated. The crowd is just super easy in, in this show because all AJ has to do at one point to get all these boos on him is just kind of looking at the French announce team and starting to dissect and take apart the table and get ready for a spot, get some of the biggest boos in the match. We have some crazy stuff in this matchup here. A superplex attempt is like thwarted and we get this kind of hard landing between the two of them. Cody makes his comeback. We get the power slam with a disaster kick. Styles hitting a brain buster on the apron. Mamma mia, I know it's the wrong country. Cody responds with a power bump on the French table though. Je suis la table. We have this double down after a kick, a big dramatic shout off in the corners. Styles hits the burning hammer. Cody kicks out at one. Man, we're just getting all the cool rare moves in WWE now. We got the top rope brain buster from Sami Zayn last month. We're getting burning hammer and a kick out at one here in France. What is this? AJ escapes the crossroads, hits the Pele kick. He goes for the phenomenal forearm, but is kicked in the mush. Cody gets the Kimura lock in, which is one of the few submissions I recall being used all show here. Cody escapes the Styles Clash and hits this ridiculous height on the Cody Cutter. He almost overshoots Styles or just kind of collides into him, but credit to Styles for coming down with him well enough to make it look good. We get the crossroads. Cody wins and retains the American Nightmare standing tall in France as the show comes to an end. I give it four and a half stars. I think it was the strongest match of the show. It was a great matchup. I think that it's funny that fans, some fans are already kind of given up the ship on Cody, like less than a month into his run. Like, I get it. Like, you know, his match with Styles here definitely feels like here is a first challenger who is good and will make you look good and it will legitimize you. And like, that that's all it really had to be here. And I, I wasn't expecting Cody to immediately dive into some brand new storyline. Like he finished the story, he won the belt, and now, now we will see where it goes. And so I think it's very impatient to be kind of criticizing it now. It's like, yeah, he's gonna take his victory lap and it's just a different time. We don't know what it's like to have a babyface champion. We haven't had that in a while uh, since Roman Reigns has had the belt for so long. So, you know, the reign is historically if you look at every like big famous title chase in history, the chase, the chase, the chase, the chase is what you remember, the reign, not so much. Even if it's an awesome reign, it's still like, eh, you know, it's, it's, it's the story of getting there that's more important. So I'm willing to wait out and see what happens with Cody as champion. I know there's a report that there's no big direction planned for him, which, okay, you know, that's, we'll see. We'll see if that actually pans out, but I mean, you gotta give it time, you know? And like, hey, if we're getting matches with guys like AJ Styles in, in this, in a match like that, if that's what we're getting, like, then that's fine. That being said, my grade for Backlash 2024 is an A-. You know, taking into account this is a shorter show, a B show, if you will. But man, like the matches were all really good. The crowd just elevated everything. Man, like they got to do more international shows, clearly, because, uh, you know, outside of the continental U.S. Because, man, between like London and San Juan and France, like... We gotta get some more of these shows. I'm really curious to see how Bash in Berlin is gonna go. Uh, you know, I think the rumblings of a London WrestleMania, I doubt we're gonna get that anytime soon. Uh, we are getting a Vegas Mania though, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. But I think for a show that didn't have Seth or Punk or Roman wrestling on it, this was very good. You know, like I said, solid matches, some story threads kind of keeping the stories going, the, the big ones. You got the, uh, the title change, the women's tag title match. Uh, you know, no Uncle Howdy or, or whatever incarnation of Bo Dallas the QR codes are, are alluding to. And look, I like the intent. I really appreciate the intent. I just don't know how jazzed I am for Bo Dallas to play Bray Wyatt. You know, that's just, 
I think let the character, let the mythos go, you know, I, I, but I don't know, they see money in it and, and I guess we'll see where it goes. Um, you know, I, I'm glad Bo Dallas is getting work, honestly, but like, I, do I want to see him do this next evolution in Wyatt lore? I don't know if that's what I want. Do you know what Triple H doesn't want? Hard questions at his press conferences. You know, for all the flack Tony Khan gets for the media scrums after AEW shows, I think Triple H also deserves some of the backlash, you know, no pun intended, because every time he's greeted with a question at these press conferences that aren't like, tell us how great WWE is, or talk about this storyline, like, it just shows he has a real lack of media training and just delivers answers that don't make him or the company necessarily look that good. In this case, he was uh, attacking the credibility of Fightful and PW Insider because the reporter at the press conference uh, asked about the about you know, Drew Gulak's supposed firing and if Ronda Rousey's allegations had anything to do with it. He brings up Fightful and PW Insider in the question and Triple H, instead of actually answering the question, if there was a connection there, he just shoots down you know the, the outlets who, by the way, didn't even report that as a connection as the reason for his firing. And, you know, he left it at that. But it's like, why would you do that? You know, why would you? It's like, Fightful is a really good wrestling media organization. And I know there's people out there that poo-poo the wrestling media and wrestling journalism for whatever reasons. But of all the ones out there that are reporting stuff on it and get it right, I think Fightful is pretty much up near the top. Just don't have these press conferences if you don't want to run the risk of being asked a hard question, whether you're AEW or WWE. Like, what's the most newsworthy thing to come out of Backlash this weekend? Like, is it the crowd? Is it Tongaloa? Is it Triple H talking smack about the media outlets out there after the show happened at the press conference? Like, you know, it's the same thing as when the scrum stuff at AEW overtakes the shows there, the shows themselves. It's not the best look. And if you don't want that to take away from your awesome show you just did, maybe don't do these things anymore. But hey, the news is not all bad. They just announced King of the Ring and Queen of the Ring tournaments uh, coming up. The brackets look pretty stacked. Uh, my quick predictions for uh, who's gonna win. For King of the Ring, I'm guessing Drew McIntyre or Gunther. And for Queen, I'm gonna predict either Shayna Baszler or Lyra Valkyria. You can let me know about that, what you think and who's gonna win in the comments below. I just hope that the women's matches get a little more time this year. And hey, they just announced WrestleMania 41 coming to Las Vegas, Allegiant Stadium. I'm so pumped for that uh, because it's a West Coast mania. I do enjoy Las Vegas, and I think it's going to be a great time there for WrestleMania week. I didn't take part in Philadelphia stuff this year, but I was definitely uh, kind of holding out hope that they would come to Vegas next year, and my prayers have been answered. It's going to be a wild time in Vegas, and uh, I'm already starting to plan some things, but I hope to see some of y'all in Las Vegas next year for WrestleMania. But what did you think of back in France. I want to hear about all that in the comment section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell icon for all the notifications. Thanks for watching this review of Backlash, folks. I hope you enjoy the things to come this month in You Can't See May themed programming. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.